Refugees not welcome in Europe. Some European countries are refusing to accept even one asylum seeker. Why are they opposing the EU program to resettle refugees across the continent? And will it make the migrant crisis worse? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. Should countries all over Europe share the burden of the refugee crisis? That's the crux of the case facing judges at the leading court in the European Union. The European Court of Justice is hearing lawsuits filed by Hungary and Slovakia. Both countries are challenging the European Union's mandatory quota to accept asylum seekers they don't want. The recommendation to the judges is to dismiss the challenge they're due to make a final ruling later this year. But how many refugees fleeing war and persecution have these countries really accepted to provoke such a challenge? The numbers are startling for some. Let's take a look. Slovakia has accepted just 210 this year. Hungary, 430. The Czech Republic voted against the EU quota system and has accepted just five more, 435. And less than 10,000 refugees this year in the UK, where immigration is a major political issue following Brexit. Germany is one of the few EU countries which has honored its commitment, accepting more than 430,000. The refugee crisis is raising questions about national identity and has boosted support for politicians from the far right. Their parties are trying to mobilize voters against accepting refugees. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban's party is seen as a favorite to win next year's parliamentary election because of its tougher anti-immigration policy. A border fence has been built along the southern frontier to protect what Hungarian leaders call ethnic homogeneity. Across the border in Austria, the Freedom Party candidate narrowly lost last year's presidential election after campaigning to limit asylum seeker benefits. In Western Europe, though, voters have rejected the nationalist wave. Marine Le Pen of the National Front in France lost the presidential race to Emmanuel Macron. A similar fate was suffered in the Netherlands by Geert Wilders, leader of the Party for Freedom. Germans vote later this year, and support for the far-right alternative for Germany party is thought to have been boosted by the open-door refugee policy of Chancellor Angela Merkel. It's expected to be the first right-wing party to win seats in the Berlin parliament since the Second World War. So let's bring in our guests now. Joining us from Brussels is Catherine Woolard, who is the Secretary General of the European Council for Refugees and Exiles. In Warsaw, we have Wojciech Szabilski, who is the editor-in-chief of Visegrad Insight. That's an analysis and opinion journal. He also specializes in Central European and EU politics. And finally, Alice Jackson, who is a volunteer at the French refugee camp Calais, also known as The Jungle. She joins us from London, and thank you to all of you. Um, Alice, I'm going to start with you as someone who, has, who volunteers and with refugees, you see firsthand what it is that they deal with. Um, what is your reaction to this, the advisor? Again, it's not a done deal, but your reaction to the advisor um, saying that these challenges should be knocked down? I think that's absolutely correct. Um, I'm absolutely shocked that in you know, my lifetime, we are seeing this, uh, this humanitarian crisis. Um, and the way that the governments have, you know, generally in Europe behaved, um, really, I feel, as a citizen of the UK, has been shameful, uh, which is why I went out uh, to volunteer in Calais. Um, and, and we're going to talk more about what your experiences have been. We appreciate you joining us. I want to get to Catherine, though, next. Catherine, what is your understanding of the, the legal grounds on which this, this EU advisor knocked these challenges mm -hmm. down, the case that this advisor made? Well, this... Thank you. The, the, I think there are two main parts to the decision. The first, the Advocate General, in his opinion, he disputes the idea that there were procedural problems with the decision. Um, so in his view, it was carried out, the decision was made in the correct way. Uh, so that's the first part. The second part is based on the appropriateness of the decision. And he argues that because there was a situation of crisis in the countries of first arrival, the decision was appropriate. It was proportionate to what was being faced. So we strongly welcome this decision. And the only way that Europe can uh, 
move out of this crisis and manage the situation is with a collective response. So I was going to say the numbers of people arriving in Europe are manageable. Uh, let's remember that 90% of the forcibly displaced persons in the world are not in Europe. Um, but Europe could only manage if it finds a system of collective responsibility sharing. And, and the relocation mechanism wasn't the answer, but it was a step in the right direction. OK, we'll talk more about the plan. But in the meantime, do, do these countries have other legal avenues to continue to resist this? Do, um, Catherine? No, um, I, I think the, the if the court agrees with the Advocate General, which is not a given, it's usually the case. Uh, we have seen judgments where the court decides not to follow the Advocate General. If the court does agree, then that is, I think, the end of the challenge um, from a legal perspective. Of course, we have seen all kinds of political obstructionism when it comes to reaching an agreement. And this is something we're concerned about because all EU member states have responsibilities under EU asylum law and international law uh, and should be able to offer protection to the refugees who are arriving in Europe, uh, the largest number of whom come from Syria, uh, where we know the situation uh, to be extremely serious. Um, Voice, is this is this a good plan? Do you think? Well, the the plan so far is the only one the European Union has, and the plan the member countries of the so-called Visegrad group have. Um, I don't think it's uh, sustainable. It's um, uh, the countries actually have been accepting refugee quotas or started to have to adhere to the European Union policy. But very low. Uh, the numbers are very, very low on, on actually accepting people, extremely low. Yeah, they are extremely low. And this is, in a way, an effect um, of the elections in Poland. Before the elections, the previous government accepted EU policy. And that would usually be the driver behind which all the other member states of the V4 would, um, would stack up. However, the previous government lost. And the leadership, the informal leadership of the political agenda came to Viktor Orban that battles the EU on all sorts of grounds. And refugees are the most uh, convenient for him to, to battle EU policy. So it's partly about refugees, but it's also partly about the politics of Viktor Orban, who sees himself as a revolutionary and counter-EU um, politician. So basically politicizing the plight of, of these immigrants. Is that what you're saying, these, the refugees? Exactly. I mean, it's, not, it's, it's partly about the sentiments of the population. I'm happy to talk about that. But predominantly, it's about the political decisions, a political game, uh, a very cynical game. The leaders of the, um, of the, of the Visegrad countries of Hungary, um, especially, and today also of Poland, uh, are using, uh, I, when I, they are abusing the issue for their political end. So, um, having said that, Alice, let's make. Um, I'm sorry, Catherine. Did you want to? Did you want to get in before I went to Alice? Yes, I wanted, if I may jump in, I mean, I agree absolutely with the points made just there. If we look at Hungary, this is a deeper question of problems with the rule of law. And um, yes, asylum seekers and refugees have been the victims of this, uh, but we see a widespread attack on the rule of law within Hungary with politicization of the judiciary, recently an attack on civil society uh, through a, a proposed law to uh, restrict foreign funding for NGOs for instance. So I think the refugee issue needs to be seen within that context. Um, Alice, as we're talking about how this issue has been so politicized and, and people's pain has been so politicized, yeah. make sure that people actually know what these refugee camps are like. They really are, and, and particularly what Calais is like for, for people yeah. who go there. Um, I think I first went out there in 2015 after we saw the explosion on the media, you know, the refugee crisis was at its height. Um, so that's what led me to go out to Calais. And I think at that time there was great sympathy. Um, I, you know, did a very local, small key, small low key collection, filled my car and drove over there. Um, and, you know, to be honest, the camp, there was no NGOs, there's no UN, very little storage and people living in, in terrible 
terrible conditions, you know, rubble, asbestos filled, um, old landfill site, um, and people with no shoes, people that have had careers like any of us, um, families um, who are living just in the most desperate situation, and having to beg children. for food and beg for shoes. Yes, lots of children. The last trip I made, um, I helped chaperone some children. And, you know, myself, I'm a mother um, and I have a toddler. And, you know, I saw toddlers walking around in the mud, um, pulling dummies out of the mud. I also helped a family with a 20-day-old baby. They'd walked, um, they'd walked the last part of the journey. They'd made a crossing from Iraq. Um, and they had a 20-day-old baby that had been born prematurely. And the mother had no support network whatsoever, so couldn't breastfeed the child, and was trying to feed the baby with a little disposable bottle. Um, that she, she didn't know about sterilising. She didn't know um, about how to keep the feeding safe. There was no one able to help her with that. And, you know, I just went as a as a mother, as a woman, and, and stepped in and tried to help her. Um, but you just, you know, that's just a real indication of the vulnerability of people, whether they're a 20 day old baby or a disabled person or an old person, or, you know, we're all people, aren't we? And we should respond in that way. And I'm just increasingly alarmed um, about, you know, the political climate and so, nationalism uh, and the disregard. Alice, let me ask you this. Do, Sorry, go on. do, do the, the yeah. refugees, whose responsibility is it to make sure that, that they know what their rights are uh, along the way? <sighs> That's a very good question. Um, the sort of penultimate time I was in the jungle before it was dismantled, um, there was a, a big push to try and inform people. So a hut had been set up where people could go and try and get advice. Um, but I think it was sketchy. And every time I met people, they would ask me, what do I do? How, who do I talk to? And I, you know, I just had to put my hands up. I don't know. I, I couldn't be that person. All I could do was offer a hand of friendship and help. Um, and there were so many people trying to do that. But you know, it was transitional because you know, I have a job, I have kids, and it, it, I think that constant turnover of people and mm. that lack of information for refugees was must be an unbelievable mindset to have to live within. Overwhelming, um, overwhelming. Well, she, really what is, is the common it is, thread? It's completely overwhelming. Could, uh, well, she, what is the... Go, go ahead, Catherine. Um, so I just wanted to answer your question as well. As ECRE, we're an alliance of now 99 organisations in 40 European countries. And many of our member organisations are doing the work that you just asked about. They're there advising refugees, individuals, uh, taking their cases forward, providing them with the information they need about their rights. Uh, and despite the very negative situation in Europe. We should also recognise the positive response of a lot of Europeans, like Alice, who's describing um, her own work, yeah. and the other volunteers who stepped up, but also these NGOs. I mean, we have more members than we've ever had in ECRE's history, because there are organisations from Ireland to Belarus who want to support refugees to realise their rights, and who want to ensure that Europe remains a place where protection is offered to to those in need. Um, Voice, I, first, I think it bears I, repeating some numbers that we already said that Slovakia has only accepted 210 refugees, um, Hungary 430, the Czech Republic 435. What is the common thread, again, between these countries that are being so resistant? Let me begin before I jump to overview of the of the society that I'm stunned also by some of the very brave people that do not only follow the natural sentiment of humanitarian aid uh, and and just uh, step in the, the same footsteps as Alice, uh, but go to the border of, on the Balkan route to meet to meet uh, and provide refugees with what is best needed, a part of water and, and resources. They need wireless connection and smartphones, which are the best way to connect and stay informed. I think that was also in the recent UN report. Uh, some of them are, are truly brave also because they oppose the government or a general, uh, general threat, general um, mood in the population, which is 
and to refugees. It's um, uh, first of all, people are fearful, and this statistic that's, that's shown in the statistics about the op public opinion, that people are afraid of, of terrorism. And somehow the narrative brought in from our eastern neighbor, uh, Russia, that is building up a, a threat against Muslim, fighting terrorism, and so on, is mounting up also in in, in our countries where Boy, Shay, is that a polite? But honestly, is that a is that just a polite way of saying this is racism? Yes, absolutely. This is racism, and this racism comes out of ignorance. This is not the racism of people who have met yeah. people from other countries, cultures, and religions. Yeah. But if you go up out, out on the street, on the major street, on a major city in any of these countries that you just mentioned, you have a very homogeneous society, and people are. I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying that this is uh, an excuse, but but you understand that those people are racist against other people they have never seen before. You also said that um, that fertility rates are even part of the issue. How so? Absolutely. Uh, right now, Hungary and Poland are among the countries that are uh, with the lowest uh, European fertility rates, and uh, they're on demographic decline. This this is alarming. This is alarming, not um, in every day, but it, the, the pressure builds up and mounts up. The governments are spending more and more, first of all, to boost fertility rates, to, to uh, enable um, people to... to to have more children, simply, um, and then they are uh, they are in fact acting or trying to project some policies that would attract uh, people to come back. That is the the theme that is building up about people who left Poland or left Slovakia or left Hungary and that would come back to their country. So this is the preference of the government to put emphasis to help people to come back when they are moving out and move in. And then there is a big other th uh, theme that is often disregarded. The, the war in the vicinity of Europe, another war that has been taking place uh, since Russia has invaded Ukraine, is, a, is indeed a great number of uh, Ukrainian people. It's a one million people that have been relocated over the last three years to Poland and other Visegrad countries that are not treated um, as, uh, as such a serious case, let's say, as, as Syrians, but yet the number is stunning and the, um, the response or, or there, there is no collective response mechanism on the basis of EU. So the government in Poland, for instance, brings it up along with other V4 countries mm -hmm. uh, that, that say, well, all right, they're uh, refugee, uh, refugees from Syria or Middle East, but then we have also another crisis situation that has to be looked up uh, after. But I think, my my personal opinion, this is this is a cheap uh, cheap way out uh, from for these governments that want to simply say that uh, they're doing something and they're experiencing some sort of other crisis in the same yeah. field. Okay, uh, the, let, let me let me get, bring Catherine into this. Catherine, is there a mm -hmm. is there a way to force these countries to step up implementation? And also, it, it seems that even the process for a, a, a refugee to be approved, to, to be accepted, to be relocated, that's a very difficult process as well. I think you hit the nail on the head there. The, there are a number of issues. One is that it's in the interest of all countries to have a functioning European asylum system. And for the points that the, the previous commentator just mentioned, there may be refugee crises, uh, large uh, flows of people coming in from the east. And at that point, um, Poland will also need the support of other member states. The, I think there are now measures uh, being proposed to try and um, enforce compliance. So we see the European Commission is taking infringement proceedings against um, Hungary and Slovakia and basically in order to get them to support the relocation mechanism. Uh, I, I think it's when we look at the relocation mechanism, it, it's unfortunate that so many member states haven't fulfilled their quotas. And the, the numbers of people to be relocated weren't huge. There are still now 11,000 people in Greece who have been approved for relocation and who now need to be, uh, to be get, gotten out of Greece as soon as possible because the situations in the hotspots and on the, the Greek islands are appalling. Um, and those are the people who immediately member states could be accepting. 
thing. Um, in Italy, the problem has been one more of registering people. Once people have been registered, they can then be relocated to other member states. So up until now, 21,000 people have been relocated from Greece and about 7,000 um, have been relocated from Italy. But we would like to see a, a great increase in those numbers. Uh Unfortunately, the relocation mechanism comes to an end in September, so I think we need to see some uh, continuation interim measures to continue with this uh, approach. Alice, as you, as you said, the, the Calais... Go, go ahead. I was just going to say that I think, um, you know, having listened to both the, the, your other two guests, um, the, the fact that it is such a political issue and that actually when, you know, Catherine is working with an NGO, for an NGO, and there are so many NGOs trying to do the legwork, but actually when you look at Greece, we know that the big issue about, you know, making things work, the huge amount of money that came in from the European Commission is because government wasn't leading, government and the NGOs, they were not quite coordinated properly. And I think our governments all have a huge responsibility to change the rhetoric so that the governments feel, uh, can, can inspire their citizens to feel pride in the fact that they are helping to bring the refugees and to start a new life and to, you know, for them really to relocate and integrate into society. I think the fact that it's been, you know, these refugees have been billed as a threat, as takers, mm -hmm. um, that they're going to take from you, um, is just so dangerous and that I think has, you know, that's what has exacerbated this situation that we find ourselves in all over Europe you know we're not we only we I was reading just before I came on air um, you know asylum applications last year the UK rejected 68% of those that's people that have already come to the UK um, so you know we're in a, a really dire straight state state ourselves um, and I just I just think that the governments have got this huge responsibility, and, and unfortunately, I feel that they are just pandering to the. So the let right. me. I want. That's a great um, point. It's, it's that's a, really a great scary point place that you make. I actually want to bring Voice into that. I think that's a great point that Alice makes. That you know, sometimes there are politicians that react to uh, voters and constituencies, but there are also politicians who can lead and who can change people's yeah. thinking. Is there any? reason to think that that the po there are politicians that can take the lead and and change what what people are saying uh, I think there are and there are not many but uh, one of them is in the office uh, it's very interesting that the president of Slovakia Andrei Kiska uh, coming from a popular vote is uh, is the president he, that opposes the, the, the rhetoric and the language used by, by the governments of the four countries in Central Europe. And he straightforwardly says, refugees welcome, they should be accepted, we should show solidarity and our human, humane face, and that, that is a politician to stand behind. Unfortunately, uh, for him and for us, for refugees, uh, the same, um, he's not in a, in a powerful, powerful position. A, a president of Slovakia means that he has mostly representative function. And he, if he tries uh, to go in a direct conflict with the policy of the government, the government can simply uh, limit his options of, of move um, if, if he goes too hard on them. Yet there are politicians who can restore the, the symbol of, of leadership in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the name of human rights and, and our humanity, and, and they are there. Um, Catherine, I'm we're sorry. about out of time, but I, I want to ask you fi finally uh, if if something sure. doesn't change, the status quo as it is right now, um, how much worse could this get for for asylum seekers? Mm -hmm. And I think we're already seeing a large amount of unnecessary suffering in Europe, uh, and this is likely to persist and, until we find a political agreement among the member states to decide on a collective response. And it may seem difficult, but we shouldn't play into the hands of those who say it's politically impossible. Um, it, all important decisions take uh, time and effort. And let's remember that the real crisis in Europe is the demographic crisis. 
crisis. So it's in everybody's interest uh, to uh, accept and absorb populations. The majority of those arriving in Europe are people who are entitled to international protection. Um, mm. so, so this is also a moral obligation. I think we're seeing people at all levels who are standing up and there are politicians in different parties but also at city level, at regional level. Even in a country like Poland you see where the central government is hostile as the speakers described. So, you have a city like Gdansk. It sounds which like, is it sounds like what you're describing. It's, it's by, it, it sounds like what, what you're describing is basically a collective effort and it's in everyone's best effort to come up with, with the working solution. Okay. Um, will that... So I think everybody who is able should be stepping up uh, to support the rights of refugees. Okay. That will be the I final agree, word. That will be the final word. Um, but thank you all for the conversation. I appreciate it. Obviously, this is an ongoing um, conversation that we will continue to have. So thank you to all of our guests, Catherine Woolard, Wojciech Shabilski, and Alice Jackson. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime if you visit our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Michelle Carey, and the entire team. Bye for now.